Thank you. All right. Well, I greet you in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope. It's uh, good to be here this morning. I representing Lamb and Lion Ministries, which I founded in 1980. And uh, I retired from the leadership of that ministry in June of 2020 and uh, moved my office to my home. And since then, I've done nothing but uh, focus on writing books. And since that time, I've written five. And uh, you can find uh, all the books I've written on our website at lamblion.com. But the five books I've written since uh, uh, 2021 or America's Suicide, and my message tomorrow morning will be based upon material in this book. Then I wrote one called, What's the Difference in a Millennium and a Millipede? And uh, I found that most people don't know. I uh, wrote one on Islam and Christianity, are they two roads to the same God? And of course I said no, but Christendom today is saying yes. The latest book I wrote is called Wars, Nine Wars of the End Times, and I'll be speaking on the message in that book uh, later this afternoon. The last book uh, I've written is called How to Die with a Smile on Your Face. And uh, when I finished that, I thought, how in the world is our graphic team ever going to come up with a cover for that? <laughs> well, they're very imaginative, and this is the cover they came up with. That's supposed, to be, that's supposed to be out next month. Uh, all of our books, are, the one on the nine wars came out in September of last year. And one month later the war started in Israel and boom, all the books disappeared. And it's been three months trying to get them republished because of the fact that most of the publishers don't have paper. I think the paper is sitting in ships off of San Diego. But Anyway, we've had a tough time getting enough paper to print this book, and it'll be out hopefully next month. Now, if you've heard me speak before, you know that I like to begin with a few smiles, and I usually do that with church signs. My, I've, got, I've been collecting them for over 40 years now. I have over 900 church signs in 29 categories. My favorite category is strange church names, like Sleeper Methodist Church. <laughs> I have been to a lot of those churches, but they didn't advertise it. Uh, here is a very strange name, but I guess appropriate name for a church in Florida, and that is the Hurricane First Church of the Nazarene. <laughs> strange name, but I love the message on the sign. Jesus is more precious than silver or golf. <laughs> the next one, I think, is a pastor who just got fed up with trying to come up with a message on his sign, so he put, blah, 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 just come to church. <laughs> Here is a very strange one. It says, what happens in Vegas is forgiven here. <laughs> Be salt and light and not salty and lit. And I tell you, I just never cease to be amazed at what people put on church signs. This next one is unbelievable. Cremation is your last chance for a smoking hot body. I don't make these up, folks. But I tell you, my, my favorite sign right now for this point in time is this one. Jesus is coming, hopefully before the election. Amen. Well, we have uh, another book also that's demonstrated on our table. It's called The Jewish People Rejected or Beloved. And my presentation in this hour is going to be taken from this book, but the book goes into it in much greater detail. Before I get into this, my title of the thing is The Evil of Replacement Theology. And I want to pray. Lord, I thank you for the way we have been blessed in fellowship, the way we've been blessed in music and worship, the way we've been blessed by looking into your word. And now we pray that you will bless as I present this very difficult topic. I pray, Lord, that what I have to say will be sobering to all of us and cause us to look into our hearts and see what our true attitude is toward 
You're a special people, the Jewish people. And I pray that what I have to say will bring honor and glory to your name. And I pray that it will drive all of us deeper into the Scriptures and closer to you and give honor and glory to your name. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to get into this particular topic by going to the root of it. And the root of it is Satan's hatred of the Jewish people. He hates them with a passion. He has always hated them with a passion, especially so today. He hates them because God has chosen them to be His witnesses to the world. He hates them because through them God gave the world the Bible. He hates them because through them God gave the world the Messiah. He hates them because God has promised that He will save a great remnant of them in the end times. Satan is determined to destroy every Jew on planet earth so that God cannot keep His promises to them. And that's what the Holocaust was all about, and it's what the Great Tribulation will be all about. The Antichrist will pick up where Hitler left off and try to kill every Jew on planet earth. The most tragic aspect of Satan's conspiracies against the Jews is that early on, it infected the church with a virulent form of anti-Semitism. I just might pause here and say to you that I'm going to share some things today that may be a great shock to you. This anti-Semitism that led up to the Holocaust did not come from Muslims. It did not come from Hindus. It did not come from Buddhists. It did not come from atheists. It came from the church. The church has the blood of Jews on its hands. And most Christians are not aware of that. You'll see that as we go along. For almost 2,000 years at large, almost 2,000 years, the church at both Catholic and Protestant has maintained that due to the fact that the Jews were the ones who killed Jesus, that God washed His hands of them in the first century and left them with no purpose and no hope whatsoever. In short, because of their continuing disobedience and the rejection of Jesus, God has placed, replaced Israel with the church, transferring the blessings promised to Israel to the church. This is called replacement theology, and those who still believe in it, the majority of all professing Christians still believe this. They consider modern-day Israel to be an accident of history with no spiritual significance whatsoever. Accordingly, they would deny that God has any special plans for the Jewish people in the end times. And again, to them, the regathering of the Jews and the reestablishment of Israel are simply accidents of history with no spiritual significance whatsoever. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Here is a statement by one of the best known names in Christendom. I think it is problematic to relate prophecy to current events unfolding in the nation state of Israel. There may be some relationship, of course. <laughs> Only God knows. But the secular state of Israel created in 1948 is not, in my understanding, identical with the Jewish people as God's chosen and called out covenant people. I strongly support Israel because it is a haven for persecuted Jews, not because I think it fulfills Bible prophecy. I also support a Palestinian state, both from historical and prudential considerations. Given the state of affairs in the Middle East, a Palestinian state is the only practical solution to peace. And who said this statement? Chuck Colson. The report, repeat, uh, I'm sorry, the roots of replacement theology and its fruit of anti-Semitism go back to the very beginning of Christianity. The very beginning. As I'm sure all of you are well aware, the church began as a Jewish institution. It was founded in Judea by Jews who were followers of a Jewish Messiah, and all its founding documents were written by Jews. The Jewish nature of the early church is attested to by this particular symbol. It is the oldest Christian symbol that has ever been found in Israel. It is carved into artifacts, all kinds of artifacts over there, and uh, it attests to the fact that the early Christians were fully aware of the fact that their roots were in Judaism. The fish became the symbol of Christianity because in Greek the fish name for fish is ichthus, and that is an acronym for Jesus Christ, God's Son and Savior. Now, as the church began to spread out of Israel, around the world, 
and it began to embrace more and more Gentiles. Very, very quickly it became predominantly a Gentile church. And when it did so, it began to forget its roots, and the Jews began to be classified as Christ killers. Let me show you how early. Ignatius of Antioch in the first century said, those who partake of the Passover are partakers of those who killed Jesus. Justin Martyr, one of the church's earliest theologians, you can see how early he was there. He declared the Jew, he, he claimed that God's covenant with Israel was no longer valid and that the Gentiles had replaced the Jews. There was Irenaeus who declared the Jews were disinherited from the grace of God. There was Tertullian, blamed the Jews for the death of Jesus and argued they had been rejected by God. There was Origen, who was responsible for much anti-Semitism, all of which was based on his assertion that the Jews were responsible for killing Jesus. Then came the Council of Elvira in 305 A.D. It prohibited Christians from sharing a meal with a Jew, marrying a Jew, blessing a Jew, or observing the Sabbath. And then came the Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D. It changed the celebration of the resurrection from the Jewish feast of first fruits to Easter in an attempt to disassociate the resurrection completely from all Jewish celebrations. Eusebius, one of the early church historians, taught that the promises of Scripture were meant for the Gentiles and the curses were meant for the Jews. He asserted that the church was the true Israel. And then there was this fellow, totally despicable, John Chrysostom. He was known in the early church as the golden tongue. He was considered the greatest preacher in the early history of the church. He did a series of some eight sermons against the Jewish people. And to give you a flavor of his sermons, here is what he said in one of them. The synagogue is not only a brothel and a theater, it is also a den of robbers and a lodging place for wild beasts. Jews are inveterate murderers possessed by the devil. Their debauchery and drunkenness gives them the manners of a pig. He went on in his sermons. He denied that the Jews could ever receive forgiveness. He claimed it was a Christian duty to hate Jews. He claimed that Jews worshipped Satan. And this man was canonized by the church as a saint. Then there was St. Jerome, another saint of the church. He was the great translator of the Bible into Latin. What he had to say is just unbelievable. He described the Jews as serpents wearing the image of Judas. Their psalms and prayers are the braying of donkeys, he said. And he said they are absolutely incapable of understanding Scripture. The very people who wrote the Scripture. Unbelievable. St. Ambrose, the Bishop of Milan. This is the man who converted Augustine, who became the greatest theologian of the early church. This is a very important individual. Listen to what he had to say about the Jewish people. The Jews are the most worthless of all men. They are lecherous, greedy, rapacious. They are perfidious murderers of Christ. They worship the devil. Their religion is sickness. The Jews are the odious assassins of Christ. And for killing God there is no expiation possible, no indulgence or pardon. Christians may never cease vengeance, and the Jews must live in servitude forever. God always hated the Jews. It is essential that all Christians hate them. Has this man ever read the Bible? He's talking about the chosen people of God here. And then Augustine. Augustine, who became the most influential of all of the early church fathers. Most, most of the Catholic doctrine is based upon his writings. He asserted that the Jews deserved death, but were destined to wander the earth to witness the victory of the church over the synagogue. Well, my folks, by the 5th century, at the beginning of the Middle Ages, the Jews had been demonized. They had been condemned. They had been ostracized to the point that the church had become a Gentile organization that was simply off limits to the Jewish people. To illustrate how severe this anti-Semitism was in the early church. Let me give for your consideration the oath that the church at Constantinople required a Jew to make. If a Jew wanted to become a Christian, they had to go before the congregation and they had to say these words. I renounce all customs, rites, legalisms, unleavened breads, 
sacrifice of lambs of the Hebrews, and all of the feasts of the Hebrews, sacrifices, prayers, aspersions, purifications, sanctifications, propitiations, fasts, new moons, Sabbath, superstitions, hymns, and chants, and observances, and synagogues, and the food and drink of the Hebrews. And it goes on. In one word, I renounce absolutely everything Jewish, every law, right, custom, and if afterwards I shall wish to deny and return to Jewish superstition, or shall be found eating with Jews, then let the trembling of Cain and the leprosy of Gehazi cleave to me, and may I be found anathema in the world to come, and may my soul be set down with Satan and the devils. And people wondered why they couldn't convert Jews to Jesus, to, to Christianity. It's incredible, folks. By the time of the Middle Ages, at the beginning of that time, two erroneous concepts had become established church doctrine. One, the Jews should be considered Christ killers and should be mistreated accordingly. Number two, the church has replaced Israel and God has no future purpose whatsoever for the Jewish people. And these two doctrines were reinforced over and over throughout the Middle Ages in a number of ways. First, the Crusades. When the Crusaders began to go to the Holy Land to liberate it from the Muslims, the Pope declared that it would be okay for them to kill Jews along the way. And they slaughtered them along the way. In fact, when they got to Jerusalem, they rounded up all the Jews they could. They put them into a synagogue. They nailed the windows and the doors shut. And the soldiers stood around that synagogue holding hands, singing, Ferris, Lord Jesus, as they burned the synagogue to the ground and killed all the Jews inside. Second is the Inquisition, which was designed to get rid of apostasy and heresy in the church, but it soon became a method of torture for the Jewish people. And that was in the 16th century. Then came the Passion Plays. We always think of the Passion Plays as something very positive, as, as reminding people that Jesus had died on the cross for them. But the Passion Plays were used throughout the Middle Ages to encourage anti-Semitism and keep it alive. So that every time a Jewish person a playing a Jewish person walked out on the stage, they wore a big hooked nose and everybody threw tomatoes at them and cursed at them all. And in addition to the Crusades, the Inquisition, the Passion Plays came the blood libels. The blood libel is something that has continued to this day. Did you know the Palestinians use this to this day? The blood libel is this, that every Passover the Jews go out and they kidnap Gentile children. They cut the throats of those Gentile children, drain their blood, and use that blood in the, in the uh, uh, celebration of Passover. And that's still used to this day. It's created a lot of hatred for the Jewish people. Also during the Middle Ages, Jews were relegated to ghettos. They were required to wear, to wear distinguishing uh, symbols that people would know they were Jews so they could spit on them. And then the Black Plague was also used against the Jewish people. Many of them were burned to death. Many of them slaughtered. And you know why? Because the Jewish people had a very low death rate during the Black Plague compared to Gentiles. And you know why they had a lower breath, death rate? Because they followed the hygienic rules of the law of Moses, which the Gentiles didn't do. So the Gentiles said, hey, these Jews are not dying as much as we are. They must be responsible for the Black Plague. What they're doing is they're poisoning the wells of, of Europe. And so they slaughtered them right and left, blaming the whole Black Plague on them. Well, we come to the Reformation in the 1500s, and we don't find much change. It produced no major changes in attitudes toward the Jewish people. For example, John Calvin reinforced the church's traditional view of the Jewish people with statements like this one. He wrote, Their rotten and unbending stiff, self, uh, stiff naked, uh, nakedness deserves that they be oppressed unendingly and without measure or end, and that they die in their misery without the pity of anyone. And if you think that's something consider Martin Luther. Now, it's interesting about Martin Luther. When the Reformation began, the first thing that Martin Luther wrote about the Jews was very, very positive. Basically, what he said in his first article about the Jews was, the Jewish people have always rejected Christ because the Roman Catholic Church has corrupted the gospel so much. But now that I have revived the true gospel of salvation by grace through faith, the Jewish people who are very intelligent will come to Jesus by the millions. And when they did not, 
He turned on them with a vengeance. And near the end of his life, he wrote an article, a pamphlet, in which he said, They are a miserable and accursed people. They are stupid fools. They are miserable, blind, and senseless. They are thieves and robbers, the great vermin of humanity. They are lazy rogues. They are blind and venomous. And this horrible pamphlet called on the Jews and their lies was written in 1543. You can find it on the internet. And what it contains is stuff that you can hardly believe. For example, he said, here's what we should do with the Jews. Number one, their synagogues and their schools should be burned. Number two, their homes should be destroyed. Number three, their Talmudic writings should be confiscated. Number four, their rabbis should be forbidden to teach. And number five, their money should be taken from them. Number six, they should be compelled into forced labor. Needless to say, this kind of thinking is what led to the Holocaust. And in Mein Kampf, Hitler had this to say about Martin Luther. He's a great warrior, a true spokesman, and a great reformer. And at the Nuremberg war crime trials after World War II, the Nazi officials each said, we were only doing what Martin Luther said. What's wrong with that? What did we do wrong? Most people are not aware of this particular heritage in Christianity, but it's there. And it's awful. It's just awful. As a result of the Holocaust, The amount of anti-Semitism being spoken by Christian leaders was very muted. It became very muted as people had tremendous sympathy for the Jewish people. But what happened really is that anti-Semitism morphed. It morphed from anti-Semitism into what is called anti-Zionism. And anti-Zionism is simply a new form of anti-Semitism. It is anti-Semitism disguised in new, sophisticated clothes. Here's what they say. Whereas anti-Semitism sought to drive out the Jews from the lands where they lived, anti-Zionism refuses to accept their right to live in their own land. So you find Christian leaders all over the place saying the Jews have no right there, they shouldn't be there. Uh, You find them... uh, Let me just give you an example. This will be a shocking example to you. Let's take an open letter to evangelicals. An open letter to evangelicals. This was produced by James, Dr. James Kennedy's Knox Theological Seminary when he was president of it. And it began with these words. The promises of the Abrahamic covenant do not apply to any particular ethnic group, but to the church of Jesus Christ, the true Israel. That's how the document began. It continued, the entitlement of any one ethnic or religious group to territory in the Middle East called the Holy Land cannot be supported by Scripture. In fact, the land promises specific to Israel in the Old Testament were fulfilled under Joshua. Under Joshua, what was fulfilled was the promise to Moses of the Canaan, of occupying Canaan. But our previous speaker just mentioned that the land promised to Israel made by the Abrahamic covenant that is yet to be fulfilled is double the size of Texas. It looks like this. That's what the true land promised to Israel is, and that's what it will be when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. Hallelujah. The open letter to evangelicals continues. The present secular state of Israel is not an authentic or prophetic realization of the Messianic kingdom of Jesus Christ. Well, of course, it's not the Messianic kingdom of Jesus Christ, but it's a step in that direction. Furthermore, this this is just unbelievable. A day should not be anticipated in which Christ's kingdom will manifest Jewish distinctives. It's going to be a Jewish kingdom, folks. Whether by its location in the land or by its ceremonial institutions and practices. Well, as you have to see, this is a terrible overview of Christian anti-Semitism that's all rooted in replacement theology. In fact, I was talking to somebody about this before I got up here. If you go back and look at the original King James Version of the Bible, 
Go over to the Old Testament, look at the book of Isaiah. And every chapter, just about every chapter says, the Lord says this to the church, the Lord says this to the church, the Lord says this. They were all into replacement theology. God wasn't speaking to the church there in Isaiah, He was speaking to the Jewish people. But in their viewpoint, the church had become the new Israel. So we have this terrible heritage in Christian history, and let's look now at the response of God's Word. The response of God's Word. I want to begin with Psalm 129. May all who hate Zion be put to shame and turned backward. Let them be like grass upon the housetops which withers before it grows up, with which the reaper does not fill his hand. Nor do those pass by say, the blessing of the Lord be upon you. Don't even give a blessing to someone who is anti-Semitic. I had something happen right here in Houston this reminded me of. I used to go over to Missouri City many, many years ago in the 80s and preach at what was called a barn. There was a church over there called a barn. And I would preach there at least once a month. And uh, they were very, very supportive of Israel. And then one day their pastor decided to move to Atlanta. They hired a new pastor who was as anti-Semitic as they could come. I mean, he, got, he called Jews the garlic eaters of the Middle East. He had all kinds of terrible things he said about them. It was unbelievable. And then one day I found out he had Zola Levitt come and speak at his congregation. I couldn't believe it. I called, I, I called and I said, well, why did you invite Zola Levitt if you hate the Jews so much? He said, well, we consider Zola Levitt a trophy. He's a trophy. I called Zola. I said, Zola, did you know that you were considered a trophy? He said, no. I said, that's what he told me. You know what Zola did? He sent the honorarium back to them. He was so outraged by their attitude toward the Jewish people. Unbelievable. Well, the problem is that all of this is rooted in one concept. The Jews killed Jesus, therefore the Jews deserve what they're getting. Well, folks, let me tell you something. The Bible makes it very clear that the crucifixion of Jesus does not fall upon the Jews only. If you don't remember any of the verse, you remember this and mark it in your Bible. Acts 4, 27. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you did anoint, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel. Now, who crucified Jesus? The Romans, the Jews, the Gentiles, and someone else who's not even mentioned in this verse. And you know who that is? You and me. We have the blood of Jesus on our hands because He died for our sins. We can't just point to the Jewish people. And the church has done that for 2,000 years. Response of God's Word, let's continue with it. The Jews were called as God's chosen people to be witnesses of what it means to have a relationship with Him. The calling of God is irrevocable. The Jews have never been rejected by God because of their unbelief. Never. Let me show you this in the Scriptures. Romans 3, verse 1, what advantage has the Jew? For 2,000 years the church has said, none whatsoever. What did Paul have to say? Great in every respect. First of all, they were entrusted with the oracles of God. What then? If some did not believe, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? And the church has said, yes. And what did Paul say? May it never be. Rather let God be found true, though every man be found a lawyer. Liar. I mean a lawyer. <laughs> uh, just a little mental, mental slip there. <laughs> or consider Romans 9, not, uh, Romans 11. You know, I went to the theological library at TCU one time, and I wanted to look at the preachers throughout history who have preached all the way through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And they had sets after sets after sets of their sermons. And I went through all of them. And 80% of them never preached on Romans 9 through 11. They said, well, that's a parenthesis of no importance and went on. Of course they didn't preach on Romans 9 through 11. Because Romans 9 through 11 says God still loves the Jewish people. God still has a purpose for the Jewish people. And the church didn't want to admit that. Doesn't want to admit today. Look at this, Romans 11. God has not rejected His people, has He? 
The church says, yes. What it says, may it never be, said Paul, for I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected His people whom He foreknew. I don't know how it could be any plainer than that. The response to God's Word, number four, it is true, however, that the Jewish people are under discipline because of the rejection of their Messiah. Jeremiah 30, 11 says, For I am with you, declares Yahweh, to save you. For I will destroy completely all the nations where I have scattered you. Only I will not destroy you completely, but I will chasten you justly, and will by no means leave you unpunished. What does God's Word say? Number five, God has preserved them because He loves them. They are the apple of His eye. God has also preserved them because He's determined to bring a great remnant to salvation, which Corey just sang about. We find that in Isaiah chapter 10. Now it will come about in that day, the end times, that the remnant of Israel will truly rely on Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel. A remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob to the mighty God. For though your people, O Israel, be like the sand of the sea, only a remnant will return. Number seven, that this passage indicates Jesus Himself said He would not return until the Jewish people are willing to accept Him and cry out, Baruch haba Bashem Adonai, blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. Every time I run across somebody in replacement theology and they tell me that God has no purpose left for the Jews, I say to them, then why did Jesus say, I will not return to this earth until the Jewish people are willing to say, Baruch haba Bashem Adonai. I would say that gives the Jewish people a purpose for the future. And I'm looking forward to that day when they will do that. Furthermore, to that remnant God will fulfill all the promises He has made to Israel. In summary, Israel definitely has a role and a future in the end times without any doubt whatsoever. Well, the fundamental message of this presentation is that God is in control. He's sitting on His throne. He's sovereign. He has the wisdom, He has the power to orchestrate all the evil of mankind to the triumph of His Son. God has already proven that point with His response to the cross. He took the most dastardly act in the history of mankind and transformed it into the most glorious through the resurrection of His Son. Satan has got to be the most frustrated character on all of planet earth because everything he throws at God comes right back into his face. And just as he was frustrated by the murdering of God's Son, he's going to be frustrating and trying to murder God's people. For a great remnant of the Jewish people is going to live to the end of the tribulation. They will be brought to the end of themselves. And when Jesus appears in the heavens, they will look upon Him whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for Him as one mourns for an only son. And they will weep bitterly over Him like the bitter weeping of a firstborn. And they will truly cry out, Baruch haba Bashem Adonai. And in the meantime, I'm crying out every day from the depths of my soul, Maranatha, 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 come quickly, Lord Jesus. In the time I have remaining, I want to make a few comments about what our good friend Olivier was talking about. I want to make a few comments about uh, what's occurring in the streets of America and the streets around the world today. As I started watching these demonstrations, something occurred to me, and this point you made, it's all based upon lies, and a lot of it is based upon lies that have to do with social justice. And that's the way they get young people in America involved in this. They don't know anything about it, but they, they believe in social justice. So, for example, let's consider the signs. Free Gaza. That is the most stupid sign you can possibly imagine. Gaza was given its total, complete freedom in 2005. And hundreds of millions of dollars flowed into Gaza from the United States and around the world to build hospitals and schools and streets and so forth. And you know what the money was used for? Three things. Number one, to buy military supplies. Number two, to build 300 miles of underground tunnels to make it possible for people to go into Israel and commit terrorist acts. And number three, to build billion dollar mansions for the leaders of Hamas in the nation of Qatar. Total nonsense. From the river to the sea, same thing, Olivia. I've watched some interview. Now, of course, the, uh, most of these are, are, are Palestinians that we have let come to the United States to study. 
But the, uh, I'm talking about the American students. I've seen the same interviews. They come up to, uh, you're, you're chanting from the river to see what river are you talking about? Well, you know that river. Well, I, w- what river is it? Well, uh, the Nile River. <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding. And they say, well, what sea? Well, Atlantic Ocean. No, it's, no, it's Jordan and the Mediterranean Sea. Oh, oh, okay. Do you know what's located between Jordan and the Mediterranean Sea? No. Israel. Oh, so when you chant that, what you're saying is annihilate Israel. Well, I don't believe that. Well, they're out there chanting it. it it's sad. And this one is the one that just drives me up the wall. And yet this, I think, gets more American students involved than any other thing. Israel equals apartheid. Folks, there is no apartheid in Israel. None. Nada. Nichivo. None. It's not there. It's not there. There's two million Palestinians that live in Israel. They have Israeli citizenship. They can vote in Israel elections. They can serve in the parliament, and they do. They, they, they have every freedom that an Israeli citizen has. They have all the welfare benefits. They can work where they want to work. They can live where they want to live. They can ride on the bus where they want to sit. There is no, there's none, none in the Israel. And yet there is not one Arab state, not one, that will allow a Jew to live in it. All the Jews have been eradicated from the Arab states. The only one guilty of apartheid are the Arab states. Yet they're blaming this on Israel, and it's a total lie. Or consider this one. In colonial oppression. There is no colonialism in Israel. Colonialism is where foreigners come and occupy a land. They say, well, it's all those white Europeans. Come on. Israel was given this land by God. And the Jews lived there for 1,500 years before they were forcibly expelled by the Romans. They come back home to their homeland. These are not foreign intruders. These are not colonialists. These are people going back to their homeland. Or consider this one. Gaza and Palestine, 75 years of occupation. Folks, come on. At the end of World War I, this was Palestine. Palestine was not an independent nation, never had been an independent nation. It was a province of the Ottoman Empire, just a province. Nearly all the land in Palestine was owned by absentee landlords in Damascus, Syria. Just poor farmers there. The land was a terrible land. They'd cut down all the trees, malaria-infested swamps. It was horrible. And suddenly the Jews start coming back and buying the land. They didn't, they didn't take the land. They bought the land. And they bought it at exorbitant prices. The Arabs laughed, laughed all the way to the bank over these crazy Jews who want to buy this land that's so worthless. They hadn't read the Scriptures. The scripture says when the Jews come back, it will become like the Garden of Eden. They planted 250 million trees in the 20th century. Trees all over Israel. They drained those swamps. They made it a land of milk and honey once again. God did, working through them. But that was Palestine. That was granted to the Jews by the British in 1917 in the Balfour Declaration. They said, this is the homeland, going to be the homeland of the Jewish people. And Jews all over the world rejoiced. But in 1921, Winston Churchill, who was foreign secretary, suddenly, on his own authority really, signed a white paper and turned over two-thirds of Palestine to the Arabs, and they created the state called Transjordan. Transjordan, which is the day the state of Jordan. There is a Palestinian state. 50% of the people live there are Palestinians. That is a Palestinian state. They keep saying we want to establish a Palestinian. They've got one. Two-thirds of it. The Jews all over the world wept. They lost two-thirds of the land that was promised them. All they had was a tiny little sliver. Even that was not enough. In 1937, the British appointed the Peel Commission to divide up that little sliver of land. And the Peel Commission came back with this map, the purple part they gave to the Arabs, the white part at the top was going to go to the Jews. The Arabs got 80% of this. And the Arabs said, no, we don't want this. In 1937, 1947, sorry, the United Nations approved the creation of two states. The Jews would get the... uh, the uh, green, uh, I'm sorry, the green part, yes, and the Arabs would get the white part. <laughs> I'm sorry, it was the other way around, yeah. And the Jews said, we were promised all that, but we'll take it. 
The Arabs said no. In 1967, the Jews offered the Arabs the West Bank and Gaza. That was after the 67 war. They said no. In 2000, Ehud Barak offered Yasser Arafat 94% of what the Arabs were requesting. Arafat said no. In fact, Bill Clinton said, I never saw anybody like Arafat. All he said once we got here was no, 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 no. In 2008, Ehud Olmert, one of the worst prime ministers in the history of Israel, a man who ended up in prison, offered Mohammed, Mahmoud Abbas all of what they were requesting, basically all of it, and he said no. Folks, that's five different offers to create a Palestinian state, and all of them have been turned down. That's why Abba, Abba Iban, the greatest diplomat in the history of Israel, once made this profound statement. He said, the Palestinians have never missed an opportunity to miss an opportunity. <laughs> Deceptive slogans, end the genocide in Gaza. There's no genocide in Gaza. Israel is not trying to exterminate the Palestinian people. They're trying to exterminate Hamas. You want to talk about genocide, this is it. By any means necessary. If it means the slaughter of all the Jews, slaughter all the Jews. By any means necessary, we want that land between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean. And so, Benjamin Netanyahu has said, if the Arabs would disarm, there would be peace in the Middle East. If Israel were to disarm, Israel would cease to exist. And that's the fundamental of the whole thing. They don't want a second Palestinian state. They want the elimination of the Jewish state. Psalm 122.6, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Put that on your prayer list and pray for it every day. Because when you pray for that, you're praying for the return of Jesus Christ. Maranatha.